my name is Jake, and I am 23 years old. I recently finished college with a degree in mechanical engineering and an engine machinist major. After looking for six months for a job, I was desperate. My wallet was empty, my bank account was empty, and I was scared of asking my parents for money as they always made me feel worthless. I was so desperate that I stopped looking for cozy office jobs and I was reviewing everything that I could find. Eventually, I found a job on a cargo ship and the pay was strangely good. I was to work the night shift in engine maintenance and I was gonna get paid $500 for every eight hour shift. That is $3,000 every week. I was excited, to say the least. I immediately called the number, and this is the conversation that ensued. Worldwide Shipping, how can I help you? Hello, my name is Jake Smith, and I called about the vacant position advertised by this company. The lady's voice changed immediately. Now it seemed almost pitiful. Hello, Mr. Smith. Please send your resume to the company email and we will contact you to communicate the outcome. I sent my resume, which consisted of my college degree, my major and my linguistic diplomas that stated my ability to speak five languages. After one day, I received an email that said I would get to have a Skype interview. The interview was normal. I was asked mundane questions about my disponibility to travel and my mental state. The following day, I received another email that stated the fact that I got the job. There was a .pdf file attached to the email that was titled, Job Requirements and Benefits. It had some instructions on what to take with me on the ship, and some orientative instructions about the medical bay, health insurance, and days of leave. I packed my stuff and went to Savannah Harbor to get picked up by the ship. When I got on board, the crew showed me around, took me to my bunk, and gave me the key to my locker. After they left, I started to organize my stuff on the bed to sort what I needed to put in my locker and what needed to stay in the bathroom. When I opened the locker, there were two crosses and a paper inside that said, Rules for the Job. These are the rules listed. Rule 1. Never, ever enter the engine room between 2011 and 2022. You will not come out. Rule 2. Always have two crosses on you at all times. Rule 3. Between 2136 and 2142, you will hear a knocking sound from the walls of the engine room. It is imperative that you shut down the engines and close your eyes. You can open them when you hear a booming voice say, Until later. If you hear any other voice or any other word, keep your eyes shut and don't move. Rule 4. The engine room is on the lowest level on the ship. If you see a flight of stairs leading below the engines, leave the engine room immediately and hang one of the crosses on the door. Do not open that door until dawn no matter what you hear. Rule 5. If you see a purple container while you check the exhausts, go back to your bunk and go to sleep while praying. You will still get paid for the shift. Rule 6. If you see a man working on the engines, do whatever he says, no matter what it is, and do not look at his face. At first, I was skeptic thinking that this was an authentic example of sailor humor. But now I am very happy that I stuck with the rules. I got convinced that they are real when I followed rule three and saved my ass from what my coworkers say was a horrible death. All this happened two months ago and I know for sure that I will stay with this company. The pay is too good to pass and I need the edge. In my third shift on the ship, I saw the purple container and did what the rules told me to do. The next morning, I managed to get lunch with the guys from the day shift, and they were quite nice. I told them what happened in my shifts, and they told me the following story. Mate, this ship is the SS Urang Medan. Ever heard of it? No, sir, I don't think I did. But the name of the boat is SS John Coping, I told him smugly. 
If you want to survive this ship, you should shut the fuck up and listen, he replied in a very aggressive way. Sorry, sir. He started to tell me about the Urang Maidan. The ship sent an eerie SOS signal in Morse code around June 1947 and two American vessels by the name of City of Baltimore and the Silver Star received the signal that said, We float. All officers, including the captain, dead in chart room and on the bridge. Probably whole of crew dead. After some unintelligible Morse code, two more words came through. I die those motherfuckers in suits said that the crew died due to unsecured hazardous materials. But I'll tell you what happened. The motherfuckers from CIA were transporting German tech from World War II, and there was a container, more exactly a purple one, which was said to contain different chemicals. But the crew reported strange noises from the container. Before the SOS message was sent, the guys that were responsible with cargo security reported that the container was open and that there were pentagrams drawn in blood on the walls of the container. They also say that the ship sunk, but we know that this isn't the case. By the time he finished the story, I was scared shitless, thinking about the rules that I found in my locker, but since I was still alive after encountering everything that the rules warned me about, I decided that I will stay and work on the ship. Now that you know what ship I work on, let me tell you my encounters with the locals. The first rule is the most important, and I'll tell you why. You see, I had a co-worker for the night shift, and given that our shift starts at 20 hundred, I didn't have time to give him the list. The poor bastard entered the engine room at 2010 and started to check the engine mounts and fuel intake. I ran to the engine room, but I didn't get to him in time just as I arrived. I saw through the open door that he was with his back on the engine, searing his skin on the hot metal, and in front of him was this creature. It was ten feet tall and had spikes from its neck to the tip of its tail. Its mouth was a mess of teeth. Some protruding through its skin. The creature was smiling. Its smile was unnaturally large. The head of the thing looked like it was splitting. It looked at me and its eyes were snake-like with two black slits engulfed in dark red. I almost pissed myself. It bit my co-worker on the torso and smashed his body on everything that it could find. I closed the door and started crying. My co-workers screams breaking the quietness of the night only to get deathly quiet once again. I couldn't sleep that day. I called my superior and told him about what happened, and he told me to open the door and do my job. He was a douche. I opened the door expecting a gory mess, but to my surprise, the room was normal. No blood, no flesh, no sign of my co-worker, and the room was smelling like rotten eggs. It was unsettlingly normal. That week was the worst one of my life. I cried myself to sleep every day that week. The second rule is pretty self-explanatory. Just have two crosses with you at all times. One in case you see the stairs in the engine room, but the other has eerie reasoning, you see. There is a creepy little girl that follows you around when you do your shifts. She is mostly harmless, but if you don't have your cross on you, she will charge at you. She won't kill or hurt you, but you will fall asleep and dream the most horrific dreams about your family, about your friends, about your pets, and about yourself. When you wake up, you will be on the floor in the engine room. God help you if you wake up at 2011. On a happier note, I am very proud to announce that I have a ghost friend when the Orang Madan sunk, there was a dog on board, and apparently he is a ghost now. He is a very happy fella, and besides the fact that his eyes are pure white, radiating light, and his body is like Vanna Black, I love him dearly. His name is Max, and he has saved my ass two times already. The little girl is afraid of him, 
and he seems to change his eyes in a bright shade of red when the container appears. I really wish that all the ghosts were like Max, but sadly, that is not the case. Bearing that in mind, I will tell you my experience with the third rule. After hearing what the dude from the day shift said about the ship, I started to do a bit of research about our creepy Urang Medan, and I've come with a lot of information. Firstly, there are anonymous reports saying that the time in which the crew died is between 2136 and 2142, and that the thing from the container bound their souls in the walls of the engine room, and the things that I hear are remnants, reoccurring manifestations of souls that are trapped between the afterlife and the overworld, of the actions performed that day. So that is that basically a scratched CD that replays itself until the end of time. This information was not satisfying for me, as it didn't explain the need for quietness, and for me not to see what is happening until the voice spoke the words. I dug deeper so I could understand what I am facing, and this is what I found. Apparently, the cycle in which the souls are put can be broken by an event that didn't occur in the time of their death, i.e., the engine sound, me talking, me moving, etc. So I know that. The next thing on the list is the booming voice that says, until later, and to my surprise, I found out that it is the voice of the demon thing from the container that is leaving the ship by a portal to hell. I didn't find an explanation for the other voices, and my most likely guess is a rupture through the fabric of our dimension caused by the gigantic quantity of power required to bound souls to iron, which is basically poison for demons as it is considered a sort of good, holy metal, so even more power, and open a portal, but I am not sure. As for not seeing what is producing the sound, I think the reasoning is to not let the demon see you. It's that kind of, if you see it, it sees you kind of bullshit. But I am not about to risk my life for a hunch. I find the reasoning for the fourth rule. But again, I have a guess that the stairs are the portal that the demon opened, but I don't know why it is not in sync with the knocking, and I really don't want to find out. Now that the creepy demon shit is out of the way, let me tell you about how my dear Max saved my ass, and now it's three times. In my tenth shift, I was already accustomed to Max and started to look after my little ghost, friendly demon, friend. Every time we stopped in a harbor, I would buy some dog food and dried meat from the local markets and give him some at the beginning of every shift. I think that for my actions, he started to have a liking for me too and would watch my back while in the engine room and while I was checking the exhausts. The first time he saved my ass was when I forgot to take my second cross for the second time, the first time I found out what happens without it. I usually keep the cross for my protection in my back pocket and the one for the door in my tool belt, but I guess that on that day I fell asleep in my work clothes and it somehow fell out of my pocket. I don't know. Anyway, I was leaving my bunk for the shift and I didn't notice. I went out and I only realized that something was off when I got to the engine room. The air was heavier and tasted metallic, like blood. I heard giggling behind me and I saw the little girl charging me. I screamed like a sheep, kind of funny now that I think about it, and my little guy jumped from my shadow and barked the most hideous sound I ever heard it was on multiple voices and almost burst my eardrums. The little girl hissed and ran away. He then escorted me to my bunk where I found my cross. The second time he saved me was when I was checking the exhausts and was so concentrated that I didn't realize the container appeared. Max barked at me, and I looked at him in a curious way. He turned his back to me and looked at the front of the ship when I looked there was the container. I saw its door slowly opening, and I ran whilst praying. 
when I got to my bunk, Max settled at my feet. I fell asleep really hard as I was in shock, but I can't deny it. My little ghost saved my ass once again from what I imagine was an eternity trapped in a wall, scaring the living crap of the guy that would replace me. The third time he saved my ass was yesterday when I was helping the guy to fix the engine and I nearly looked at his face. A split second before seeing his face, Max tackled me to the ground, his body absorbing every photon from around my eyes. I remember saying, damn, he's fast. Good thing he's my buddy. Before returning to my task of giving him the eyes and fingers he asked for. After I left the ship, I saw Max's eyes in the shadows. I didn't think much of it, because my little buddy often followed me when the ship was stationed. The day at the beach was uneventful, just some sailors with some beers and joints. The night was full, to say the least. After sunset, the guys went back to the ship, but I went into the bar to get wasted as a normal person would do on such occasion. I met a girl there and she was stunning. Imagine every man's dream combined into a single body, and she was smart, hella smart. We started to hit it off. After an hour of talking to her, she asked the question. That question that makes a man know that it is the time to use that dusty old condom in his wallet. Do you want to get out of here? At that time, my other head was thinking, and I accepted. We made out all the way inside the forest, and somehow I didn't realize that she started changing. Her eyes were yellow. Then she had wings. Then I saw her mouth, and as soon as I realized that she had way too many teeth, I tried to nope it out. She was fast, inhumanly fast and caught up to me soon after I took off running. It tackled me, and I punched her in the temple. Its face didn't even flinch. Soon after I registered the pain and looked at my palm that was badly broken, my palm looked like a piece of uncooked steak, just hanging there only held by my muscles. I screamed like a little girl and pushed it off of me with my legs. I knew that I wouldn't run far away but I still tried. After running for 10 meters, I looked behind and saw that it was nearly touching me. I blinked, and it was gone. I felt compelled to stop like I was somehow controlled, and when I did, I could hear two things. High-pitched shrieks and low guttural growls. After letting out a silent, what the fuck? My buddy Max walked out from a bush, blood dripping from his mouth, that now had a lot more teeth. Then I heard multiple voices, voices that were talking as one but not with my ears. I heard them in my head. Jake, I won't hurt you, but fuck, you deserve it. I never seen someone so stupid. I let out a confused, Max? Then the voices came again. You know me as Max, but my name is Brawl, being a bit more confident and relaxed. I said, Brawl is a little hard to pronounce. Can I still call you Max? As you wish. Put your hand in my mouth. Oh, God. Max seemed a bit annoyed. He doesn't have any business with me. Now put your hand in my mouth. I did as he asked, knowing that I was royally fucked. He bit my hand so hard that it broke away from my forearm. I screamed in pain and took a look at what I assumed it will be a stump but I was amazed to find out that my broken hand was now intact. Even the scar I had from cutting my hand in a bandsaw was gone. My hand was now good as new, except for the burn mark inside of my palm in form of a flame. What the fuck was that? I asked Max Brawl, in a spooked way. A sphinx. I hate those assholes. What did it want with me? It wanted to eat you. I was spooked and kind of afraid of Max, but I started to head to the ship for a good night's rest. While walking, I asked Max, Why do you help me? He responded, Because I'm lonely. Every human either hates me, either fears me. You are the only one that didn't look at me with fear or hatred. That saddened me, but hey, life, death, is a bitch. 
The next morning I looked up Brawl on Google. I am friends with a hellhound. I guess that is good. I am friend with a demon dog. Now that you know my wild night, let me tell you about Rule 4. The stairs are a portal to hell, the portal that the thing from the container used to go back home. And I guess that the rip between worlds remained, and it is now used by other demons to fuck with us humans. I asked Max about it, but he said it is better for me to not know, and just stick to the rule. I am not about to press my curiosity on a hellhound, so I guess that is how it will stay. The demon that used the voice of my mom is a mimic demon, and they are scary assholes. They can turn into anything they want, Max, and mimic voices. I really hope I don't hear that asshole again. I won't bother to explain Rule 5 as you know from the last post what it is. I have just a bit of new information about it. I asked Max about the container and he only said, he is my last owner, Olivier. I googled Olivier and apparently he is the demon of cruelty, so someone I don't want to meet. I didn't ask Max more about it as he seemed really sad. This is all for now. I have to find out what the burn from my hand means. I think it is some kind of protection because last night I closed the door on my hand and the door bent. So I guess that is cool, but I hope it doesn't mean that I sold my soul. I will post more this week after I find out what the fuck is a sphinx and why the fuck one wanted to eat me. After I woke up the next morning, I tried to understand what happened and I started with the burn mark from my palm. It is sort of an ownership sign, and it basically means that Max has accepted me as an owner, and so I am bound to him. Everywhere I go, he follows me like a shadow. So I didn't sell my soul. After that, I found out why the Sphinx bitch tried to eat me. Apparently the question she asked me in the bar was a riddle, and I didn't answer. Those who don't answer a sphinx's riddle get eaten. After some more research, I found out that sphinxes have a community. There are around 50 of them in one, and they are really vengeful. I talked with the only thing that knew more, Max, and he told me that he already got it covered, so I relaxed a bit. That night, I got a new co-worker for the night shift. His name is Morris, and he is built like a tank, I'm talking 300 pounds of pure muscle, that dude towered over me. I gave him the list, not wanting to make the same mistake I did with my first co-worker, and he said in a raspy voice, Oh, you found my list. Nice to see some people that listen. I was dumbfounded. You are the guy that left me the list? Yes, I am the one that saved your life he said as he reached for a handshake. We shook hands, and he said in a surprised tone, I see that you got on Brawl's good side. The room boomed with Max's voice. Yes, indeed. How have you been, Morris? Morris responded in a tired voice. Meh, the Wendigos are crazy this time of year. I assisted a Sasquatch birth and killed a Wahila. How about you? Just helping this dumbass to survive, he annoyed the Sphinx community. Morris looked like a ghost, and I realized that whatever made this tank of a man so scared is coming for me. They must have seen me getting dizzy because Morris said, We need to start prepping. They will be here shortly. Morris took a bag from his bunk and opened it. It was full of guns. I'm talking AKs, pistols, knives an MP5, a Spaz 12, and about 50 mags of ammo. He said that the guns and mags were loaded with silver and bronze bullets that were filled with a mixture of holy water, white ash, and enough ricin to kill a fucking whale. He gave me the MP5, two pistols, a knife that he said was blessed by a priest from every religion, and enough ammo for a small army. I felt very badass for a minute, before realizing that this arsenal is intended for some evil things that are coming for me. After gearing up, 
Morris gave me a little bottle with a clear liquid inside and told me to drink it. The liquid tasted awful and burned the whole way down. He said that it was some sort of poison that will kill a sphinx but will not harm me. After he said that, we started to hear water splashing and then bangs coming from the lower parts of the ship. Morris told me to get ready because the sphinxes arrived. What followed next was an all-out war. The creatures jumped on the deck and started to screech, then they went quiet. A scarred and old-looking one stepped in front of the group and spoke. Give us the one that didn't respond to the riddle, and we shall leave. If you don't do so, we shall eat all of you. Morris said in his raspy voice, Munch on this bitch! Just before shooting the thing in the face with his AK. The creature dropped dead and started to melt in some kind of acid and dissolve the metal floor underneath it. I froze as Morris shot at the other creatures. After a few shots, I regained composure and started to shoot my MP5. Max jumped from the shadows and bit the head of one of the creatures. He was now different. He was bigger. His eyes were blood red and he was flaming. The flame radiated pure rage. The creatures fell one by one, but in my state, I didn't see the one that crept behind me. It lunged at me, biting my leg, then it recoiled in pain and started to melt into the strange acid. That thing Morris gave me did its job. My leg regenerated very fast due to the ownership mark. In about 45 minutes, all of the creatures were dead and the ship looked like Swiss cheese. In our fight or flight state, we didn't realize that the purple container appeared, and when I looked at it, I saw two yellow eyes. The eyes locked with mine, and I could feel it gazing into my soul. I heard Max howl, and then I heard his voice in my head, He is here! I knew who he was. He was Olivier, and he wanted me dead. I felt dread as the air around me changed. It got heavier, colder, and now smelled like rotten eggs. I could feel every molecule of it was bleeding evil. Olivier spoke in a terrible voice that made my ears bleed. I could feel he was pissed. He was pissed that I took his dog, and the only way he would get Max back was to kill me. A sphinx leaped at Olivier from the shadows, and it disintegrated as soon as it touched his skin. The demon was smiling. I shot at him, and he disappeared with his container, but I know he is watching me. I see his yellow eyes in the water. I know I don't have long before I slip up, and I know he is counting on that. <laughs>